blessings to you on this fine day at Cairo. For those of you who are on the West Coast with me at Kaisao for the East Coast family. At Kuroleo for those who are further east going into Europe, Africa and beyond. Wherever you are, whatever time of day it is, whomever you're with, I pray that all good things will abide with you. Your heart will be filled with joy. Your mind will be sparked with curiosity and inspiration and your hands and your body are ready to put in work for the good cause. I say today I want to share a really brief but very poignant discussion on the three rules of victory, what it means to be victorious, what it means to secure a victory. Okay. A lot of times we will talk about winning, right? Everybody loves to win. Everybody loves to win. Everybody loves to win. But if you don't have a really clear understanding of what it means to actually win and, and what it means to actually be victorious, you can kind of find yourself in a vicious um, cycle, like a dog chasing his tail, right? And so I want to share some things that will help you to avert that, uh, that trend. So the first thing, first rule that I have found uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way of being victorious is you got to define your victory correctly. You got to have a really clear and precise and correct definition of victory. What do I mean by that? The Yoruba say that one should never engage in physical combat with a midget. All right. One should never engage in physical contact, physical combat with a midget. Why? Because even if you win, you lose. Right. No one's going to call that a victory. You six foot six, 280 pounds and you throwing this midget around that. That's not a victory. Right. No one's going to congratulate you for that. You're not even going to feel good about that. What it means is you've got to assess whether or not you're actually going to come out with a win and it's going to count as a victory for you. Why? Because some people, most people actually just like to fight. You got a big category of people who can only make decisions if they are angry. They can only feel empowered if they're angry. They only have a sense of conviction if they're angry. Their whole identity is defined by resisting other people and other things. If they don't have something to fight, they don't have an existence. They are completely and absolutely bound by reactionary behavior. Okay? You don't want to get tripped up with people like that. Those are people who will drag you into the fool's den and keep you there for decades. You'll be fighting and arguing and quarreling and bickering for nothing. Why? Because there's no real victory. There's nothing to actually gain. Right. There's no winner and there's no loser. So you got to steer clear of those kinds of energy. You find that a lot in families. Right. People will be battling with their family members and there's no winner. You can't win. You can't defeat the, the, the other person. It's like the Yoruba also say the tongue and the teeth will sometimes fight, but never to the death. The tongue and the teeth will sometimes fight, but never to the death. The tongue can't really defeat the teeth. Right. What, that, what kind of victory would that be? The teeth can't really defeat the tongue. Right. So you got to be discerning when it comes to any kind of a contest. Can you actually win? Right. Or is this just chasing your tail? All right. That's rule number one. Define your victory correctly. Rule number two is this requires a little bit of, you know, projection. Also, this is going deeper into the future and doing some scenario mapping. Right. So let's say you have a contest and you actually uh, win. Now you got to ass assess what is it going to take for you to keep it? What's it going to take for you to keep it? Is it worth the effort to keep this thing? Is it worth the effort to sustain it, to maintain it, to uphold that thing? Is that the life that you really want to live? I, this is something that I find a lot with, with folks who are considering being initiated to Orisha. Right. When I tell them, hey, this is for life. If you install this altar in your house. This is a lifelong commitment. Okay. 
these are going to be the habits and the lifestyles that you're going to have to adopt in order to have this object, this shrine, this altar in your house. It's not an event, right? We tend to be really event driven. Oh, I, I got married. There was a wedding. There was a ceremony. There was people and food and drumming and dancing or whatever the case that is associated with the event. But the event is not the what it takes to say, sustain it. The Yoruba say that the wisdom it takes to build the house is small compared to the wisdom it takes to live in the house. Right. As complicated as it is to build the house, the engineering, the architecture, you know, all the circuitry and the water systems, everything that goes into a well-built house. Right. It's not easy. But that is small compared to the wisdom it takes to live in the house, to have a spouse, to have children, to have aunts and uncles and friends and neighbors and all of the things that that are required to maintain those systems. Right. So once you have determined what the victory is. Rule number two is getting really clear about what it takes to maintain or sustain the victory. Once you've got it, are you willing to hold it? And keeping in mind that the Yoruba proverbial wisdom also tells us beauty fades faster than wisdom appears. Beauty fades faster than wisdom appears. So it means that in a relationship, what looks good, that's going to dissipate really quick compared to the wisdom it takes to relate, to maintain and grow and develop and mature in that relationship. This is true of everything that you do, though. It's not just in terms of love. It's in terms of, like I said, it's in terms of your orisha. It's in terms of your job. It's in terms of your craft. Sometimes people are trying to grapple between should I pursue one line of business or should I maintain my job? Should I stay at this job? Well, you got to know that, hey, beauty is going to the, the beauty of one or the other is going to fade faster than your wisdom is going to grow. So you got to be patient. OK, and you've got to be realistic about what is it going to take to live that life? Are you about that life? Five years, 10 years, 15 years 20 years later, do you perceive that you're going to be excited and enthusiastic about living that life? If not, then you want to be careful about conquering in that area, being successful in that area. Everything ain't for everybody. OK, rule number three. Seek wisdom. Seek wisdom. It's not the same to get people to commiserate with you. Right. A lot of times we'll commiserate with people. We'll get with people who will, you know, stroke our ego and they'll soothe our pain and they'll tell us what we want to hear to make us feel like we're on top and we're doing the right thing. And it was the other person's fault and blah, 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 blah. That's good for your immediate, you know, feel good. But when it comes to making sound decisions and progressing and growing in your life, you need wisdom. Wisdom is going to give you full context for your decision making. Wisdom is going to lay out for you the, 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 the consequences and the values that are associated with doing one thing or doing another thing. Wisdom comes from people and from systems that are older, more advanced, more mature, have been along, around longer than you. Your friends don't have wisdom. Your friends might be wise for, uh, you know, relative to younger people. But as far as you and, and, and your well-being is concerned, don't rely upon your age mates and your peers. Don't do that. That's foolish. You will lose. In the long run, you will lose. Look to people who are further down the road. Look to people who have a structure and a facility and a, and a method and an approach that has been proven. Right. Seek refuge under a, a nice Sadie tree. This is a, a Yoruba proverb. Find a nice tree with a nice trunk. And broad branches and seek shade, seek shade under a nice, big, broad tree. OK, that's wisdom. The Ifa of our temple or Turupon one Ifa tells us when we wake up in the morning, we should teach one another wisdom. 
and not lay the foundation for foolishness. Once we've deliberated with one another for a long time, if we still can't come up with an answer, then we seek the wisdom of Ifa. Wisdom creates context for decision making and wisdom is always associated with seniority. It's always associated with stability. It's always associated with patience. Okay. Wisdom is always associated with right application of knowledge. Okay. Your age mates and your peers, they may have knowledge and information, but do they know how to apply that knowledge the right way in the, in that situation? Okay. So part of taking advice is really understanding where the wisdom is and what wisdom is and how wisdom functions. And then the other part of it is real basic. It's following instructions, right? The Yoruba say, follow the directions, take the medicine exactly as the herbalist told you to do it. If they said you take the medicine on Tuesdays, then you take it on Tuesdays. If they said you take it with water, take it with water. If they said you take it with palm oil, you take it with palm oil. Okay, so seeking wisdom implies that you're going to also follow directions. It's fine. It's it's wise for you to follow instructions. It's wise once you have determined that, hey, this is my source of wisdom, then the best thing for you to do is follow that wisdom. Sometimes things will work out exactly as you expected, exactly as you were advised to do. Sometimes it will be a little bit different. But if you follow the rules, wherever it deviates, then you at least can come back and you have a clear point of reference to say we were good up to level four and then things seem to deviate. Why did they deviate at that point? And then you can adjust and correct. And the next time you go through, it'll be that much better. All right. So to recap, the three rules of victory. Number one, define your victory correctly. OK, don't engage in activities that there is no real clearly defined victory. The objective is not to fight. The objective is to win. The objective, the objective is not just to be there at the table, not just to be there playing the game. The objective is to win, to take the gold, to beat the top, to be number one as much as you possibly can. That is the goal. Number two, determine what it takes to keep it. If you if you can't keep it right, you can't win it today and then lose it tomorrow. If you or if, if you win it today and then you're going to lose everything else trying to keep that one thing, then that's not a sound victory. And rule number three, seek wisdom. Go to the places where you can get real direction, real context, real wisdom, real step by step instructions on how to apply the rules and the principles. OK, if you can follow those three rules, I am absolutely certain that you will see success in whatever area of life that you choose to apply them in your love life, in your business life in your spiritual life, you're going to be able to to progress if you are willing to follow these three rules of victory. OK, but now I don't have the all seeing eye and these three rules are just three of many rules. I'm sure that in your life and your experience, you've also seen some really constant principles play out. So I want to hear from you. What are some of your rules of victory? What do you think is really essential for someone to be able to progress and do better progressively and reliably in any area of their life. Share your comments in the uh, comment section. I'd love to hear and share with you a little bit more. Until then, may your wisdom increase. May your blessings intensify. May your happiness be boundless. May your compassion continue to deepen. Bye for now. Yeah, yeah, I'm a good boy, you know that. You wanna be.